Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Well, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsipornshai. And it's good to have you back this week, brother. We had uh, Eric stood in for you last week. And so, yeah, thank you, Eric Dotson, for um, holding the fort down. And I forgive you for mispronouncing my last name. Twice, I think. Is that right? <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, um, I, I know guys will see my background and wonder what's up. It's because um, I'm in a in a room that looks like I'm in a prison cell or what? What did you say before we I came interrogation on? Room. Uh, it's an just, interrogation it's just a room. room. It's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, one of the rooms in uh, the the house we're living in at the moment while we're looking for a place to buy. Um, sort of our junk room. And yeah, it's just kind of white walls. We could throw some pads up there and it'd look really exciting. Um, but uh, anyway, so we got an interesting topic uh, today, which uh, we just decided on about five minutes ago. Um <laughs> And it's the the good thing about uh, being pastors is, you know, you can pull from a plethora of topics kind of last moment and talk about them. But um, this is an interesting one, I think, for guys in our camp, sort of the reformed camp. Um, We're going to talk about money. Uh, We don't like to talk about money um, too much in our camp, I think, because at least one reason is probably because we don't want people to misunderstand uh, because of all the abuses out there. So you've got the yeah. health, wealth, and prosperity gospel where yeah. these guys are basically teaching, you know, sacrifice, give everything you can, even until it hurts, and then give a little more, and God will, you know, miraculously give you back 10 times what you gave. Um, yeah. And so I think we kind of shy away from it at times, um, and, unless it's in the text we're preaching. And um, and so, yeah, I but for our people, I think it'd be good just to talk about what faithful financial stewardship looks like. Um, and so, yeah, let's just open this up. And uh, let, let me go to one of the passages um, that everyone would be familiar with when we talk about giving to the church. And we'll just kind of hit several different areas of giving. Second Corinthians 9, 7, uh, the apostle writes, each one must do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, and uh, so I'm reading out of the LSB, if that sounds a little bit different than uh, some of the other versions. But, you know, Paul here is talking about giving. And I guess let's spend a couple minutes just uh, up front, um, not too much time, because instantly people are going to say, well, well, I tithe. Right. So what's the difference between Old Testament tithing and New Testament giving? Because there is a difference. Yeah, tithing goes back to the Old Testament. It was a requirement for all Israelites. And the common notion that tithing was 10% is actually false, because if you take everything and put it together, um, the Israelites gave um, sometimes up to 30, 33% of what they had. In, in various forms. And so it was really to help support their nation because Israel was a theocracy. Um, it, today in our day and age, uh, we have taxes. Taxes are paid in order to uh, support things like law enforcement, infrastructure, uh, things like that. Uh, whereas in the days of the Israelites, without having a tithe, they, they really would have no means of being able to support their own kind of government structure. So um, taking care of the poor and, and things like that. That was all part of the, the tithing process. But in the New Testament, the tithing, the, the command to tithe never shows up anywhere in the New Testament. And in fact, what we see in passages like 2 Corinthians 9, what you just read, is that God wants us to give out of the heart, not because it's required, not because it's meritorious, not because it's necessary for salvation, not because we can lose our salvation— it's because we we give out of a desire to uh, glorify God. And in this case, in chapter 9, um, what we saw from the Apostle Paul was that he would often go about and raise money for poor saints that were in Jerusalem. Um, so this was raising money for fellow believers at another church in this case. 
you know, we often stress the importance of the local church, but this is one of those instances where a church was pulling their money together in order to give for another church that had a lot less need, or at least another body of believers. So uh, giving in the New Testament, it should be done from the heart, it should be done for God's glory, and it should be really done with the idea of meeting God's purpose and, and will for His people and the church and the ministries that the church supports. Yeah, it it's um it's a good distinction to understand, um, and really it's uh, it makes giving a lot more free in 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 the New Testament, in that you're not restricted to you know giving the the ten percent, and I mean like you mentioned, in reality, um, it would have been more in the 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 thirty you know thirty three percent area. Um, some people can give more than that. Some people can give less yeah. than that. You know, the point is that you're giving. And I think when we think about giving, so, you know, a faithful pastor is not thinking about people giving um, just so that, you know, the church can get wealthy and he can increase his salary and things like that. Um, let, let's just talk about the the spiritual reality um, behind types of people and, and their giving. And so what, what kind of, um, what kind of things does it communicate when we find someone who is um, faithful in 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 their giving versus someone who is, and we'll just use the term stingy in yeah. their giving. Um, well, does it yeah. matter? Is there a real spiritual dynamic or is it just a plain money issue? No, it really does matter. I mean, we are stewards of all that God gives to us. And, and two areas that this really shows itself the most, I think, is time and money. Um, where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our money? And there used to be a saying when I was growing up, back when everyone had checkbooks, is that uh, you know you can look at someone's checkbook and know immediately where their heart is. Uh, and so there's that saying, where your your heart is, that's that's where your love and devotion goes to. So someone that spends a lot of money just shopping for personal items, uh, things that are not necessities, but things are just that that are more luxury items, um, comfort items, uh, things like that. When all of your money is going towards that and and very little time and money is going towards things that are of spiritual importance, yeah, it does matter. You know, so we want to take what we've got and Jesus gave the uh, the, the the parable, I, I want to say of the the talents where three of his uh, three servants were, were given a certain amount of money and and uh, some of them, two of them invested it, one of them just kind of dug it into a ground. And Jesus rebuked him for not at least putting it into like a bank and getting some interest off of it. Um, so we are, and that that parable I think illustrates the the issue. I mean, what we have, we got to ask ourselves, how are we going to glorify God with this? And it doesn't mean that we go into some kind of monastic mode where we become monks and we deny ourselves of all things that give us pleasure or things that are enjoyable, um, and, and simply live a life of just sheer simplicity. Um, but it, it does mean that in every aspect of our life, there should be some thought towards how can we glorify God with what God has given us. Yeah, and I think that starts at really recognizing that all that we have comes from the Lord, right? Yeah. And and I, and I think that, that sort of eases um, the at, at least the temptation as humans to want to hold on to and hoard things, right? And yeah. obviously, we have responsibilities, and so um, good stewardship is not just are you or are you, are you giving to the church, are you giving to um, needs of those around you, but it's are you taking care of your own family? Yeah, you know, it's a silly thing, and this is it's one of the things that we all hate about the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel, um, and even this was the same thing that uh, the Pharisees were rebuked for, right? They would. They would rather you give all your money to the church and not take care of your family, right? And pass yeah. that off as something that was spiritual. I mean, it's the same thing the prosperity gospel does today, um, where you know scripture also teaches us that you know those who doesn't take care of his own household is worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. And so you know, what do you do for the person who is stuck in that kind of? tithe mentality where you know they've misunderstood what that means just in general and they come to the end of the month and they think you know what i only have x amount of dollars and let's just assume they've been faithful they just don't have a lot coming in and 
you know, they live in California in the middle of the summer and you got to run the air conditioner or you'll die. Um, <laughs> Especially you know, where I am. That's and, right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and so they're sitting there and the person is thinking, well, what do I do? Because if I, if I give uh, this week to the church then I won't have enough money for my yeah. light bill, am I in sin? Right. Should I just do without electricity uh, and, until the next paycheck? Um, what, what does good stewardship look like in that scenario? And then we'll jump to a different scenario. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a good scenario. And before I answer that, let, let me just read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, when Paul says, "Who for who regards you as superior, and what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So in other words, just to back up your prior point, that everything that we have received, it's really not ourselves. It's it's of God providing it to us. Even when you go to work and you earn a wage, well, God is the one that provides you with those gifts and, and that opportunity to be able to do that. And so everything we have comes from the Lord, and we want to glorify Him with that. Now, good question. So, I mean, what about uh, people who are very financially strapped? Uh, they're in very difficult situations. Um, the person may have lost a job, maybe mom and dad, living on a single income, trying to feed multiple mouths, trying to keep up with the mortgage. Um, and, and all the just basic living expenses. And I've heard a number of pastors say, well, you just have to trust God and continue to give, and God's going to bless that. And I've heard stories about how God has done wonders when 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 people have done that. Um, I actually don't recommend people give beyond what they can give. So first, look at what your needs are for the family. And there are times that, look, if you're if you're in a situation where you don't have work and all that kinds of stuff, uh, don't give to the church. Get make sure your family needs are met first. Make sure your bills are paid. Um, just keep coming to church. Uh, serve with whatever time you've got. And and again, that's why I said time and money are both valuable resources. Some people don't have money, but they have time. And and with their time, they can actually serve. And someone who's not working, you know, I would recommend. Obviously, they. They spend uh, an adequate amount of time every day looking for work, looking for a job, developing skills, treat the search for a new job as your job. But if you've got additional time devoted to the church as well, um, you know, help volunteer with um, teaching ministries, youth ministries, just serving one another, um, prayer ministries, things like that. So there's a lot of things that people can do. But I think of Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches the first sermon, 3,000 people are added to the church. And when you get to the end of Acts chapter 2, what's happening? Well, everything, everyone had everything in common, but what does that mean? That means that people who had the means were actually giving in order to meet the needs of those who didn't, right? And, and so people were giving their property and stuff like that. So even if you want to hold to this kind of 10% tithing as, as, as kind of a standard, well, a lot of people are going well above and beyond that, obviously, to meet the needs of those who would not have been able to meet that. So the church, we operate as one organism, and those who have extra um, help pitch in for those who are struggling, right? But now I, I would also say this, for those who are struggling and they come for financial assistance, I do believe that it is the job of the leaders of the church not only to minister to that family's needs, but also to even get involved with financially under and a financial understanding of what they're taking in what's going out to help them make more responsible decisions. That might sound kind of invasive, um, kind of invading in our own private uh, territory, but if you're under the authority of the leadership of the church and you've really submitted uh, to following their guidance and their desire is for you to glorify God, then I think that is more than reasonable. And there's been instances in the past where um, I've seen people, you know, they open up their finances and you know, it turns out they're spending, you know, 150 to 200 dollars on their cellular bill every every month, right? Which is totally unnecessary. Well, why do they do that? Because they want the fastest internet uh, plan and the most data and this and that. Well, you know, you got to stop and think. Okay, is that really a need? And given that you have all these other financial needs, um, could you not cut back on that in order to meet this? Other people have expensive cable packages where they've got the season pass for all their favorite sports teams, and that could easily run over a hundred to two hundred dollars a month as well. Well, is that really essential, right? Um, yeah. And then on other, in the other hand, I mean, you might have 
your mortgage payment that is going to be several hundred, a thousand, over a thousand dollars, you need to pay that, right? If you need a place to stay or or start looking at um, other living accommodations that are not going to cost nearly as much. But, you know, in this day and age, in this economy, if, for instance, you're here where I'm at, good luck with that because even finding a place to rent, um, will uh, that the rental amount is um, is often higher than what you would pay for a mortgage on an older home. So you have to look at all those factors and you got to meet your needs first. And, and you have to be able to discern what is a need and what is just for entertainment. And, and keep in mind that the, the church can always use um, not just your money, but your time as well. And, and there's a lot of efforts that are for the glory of God that are not being met when it just goes into your own personal entertainment. Yeah. And I, I like that you brought up, it can seem invasive. Um, and for those who are still kind of thinking about that, I mean, here's the reality. Um, you know, elders getting involved in that way when necessary is a form of shepherding yeah. because stewardship is a spiritual issue. And, um, you know, and so if someone is, you know, if you're listening to this and you're not giving to your church um, regularly, um, and yet you have, you know, one of these hundred, two hundred dollar month cable packages, I would argue that you're being unfaithful as a steward yeah. of your money. Um, you know, cut it down, get a different package, cut it out altogether. Um, there are often times, uh, I think, where people spend a lot of money on frivolous things and and then they don't have money to give to the church. Um, and so again, this is the assumption bills are paid. That would be the same. You know, if you have bills, you can't pay, but you're, you you have a cable package, um, you know, or any of the things that you mentioned. In today's world, you know, I would think of things like, you know, if you're paying for, um, you know, just whatever, Amazon Prime and no. uh, these video game subscriptions. Yeah, those subscriptions. I mean, there's a subscription yeah. for everything those today, right? subscriptions add up fast, yes. And so if you don't have money to pay bills, um, it could be just that you're just being a poor steward of what God's given you. It is God's money. No. Um, if you're not giving to the church, it could just be that you're you're being a poor steward and you should cut some of those things out. And I think um, the hesitancy sometimes in that would would reveal a heart that probably values the work of the church less than it ought to. If you're unwilling to cut out your PlayStation subscription so that you can start giving to the church, your heart is is in a different place than it ought to be. Mm. Um, and I think that would be something to think through and to pray about. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, people who are maybe struggling to uh, find money for different things. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the other side, right? The, the guys who have plenty of money. Um, and, and by the way, before we move to that side, I would just say, for me, I want to see um, the expectation, I think, in the New Testament is that you are giving to your local church. Um, th there's no amount given. And so if, if all you can afford is $5 a month, um, and you bring that as an act of worship, because that's what it should be, um, and you're managing your finances well, you're, you're, you're trying to be a good steward, then praise God, don't be ashamed of that. God receives that um, as, as faithful worship. And, and so never think, um, you know, that if you can't give a lot, it's not worth giving because it's a posture of worship. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. we think about the, the widow's might, right. Mm -hmm. Um, who, who gave exceedingly above, uh, even the Pharisees who were able to give more in terms of the amount they were giving. Yeah. She um, gave it all. And, yep. Yeah. And so, um, and, and so we need to think about that. Now we come to the other side and we realize that there are some people who are very wealthy in the church. Um, and I think they, they, they have the same types of struggles in different areas as everyone else. Um, I reminded of, uh, Paul's admonition to Timothy in first Timothy. In fact, let me yep. just read that first yep. Timothy six, nine, um, Paul says, but those who, oh, sorry, uh, wrong six, wrong 17, place. uh, 17. Yeah. Yep. Command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, command them to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share, 
storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is in life, which is life indeed. And so I think you have two kind of primary dynamics with folks who maybe aren't even just rich, but who aren't struggling. Um, you can have the tendency to not give what what you should give, right? You have an abundance and you think, okay, I'm just going to give a little bit. And there's no real act of worship or sacrifice in that. So that could be a temptation. Um, and then on the other side, right, it could it could just be... Well, let's just start with that one. Let, let's talk about let, let's talk about the the lifestyle of of kind of the wealthy and their giving, and we'll probably just go back to the reality that giving to the church is meant to be an act of worship, and so if you're doing it as a form of appeasement um, for man, just to say, hey, you know what, I can give two thousand dollars a month, when in reality the Lord's blessed you with enough that you should be giving five thousand. Or whatever it is, um, and, and you're withholding that because somehow uh, you've bought into the lie that you need to hoard your your wealth, then y- you would be in a place that would be dishonoring to the Lord too. That would be unfaithful as as a steward. Talk to that. I just threw out random numbers. You know, we're not yeah. wanting to set a you have to give X amount. It, right, it is right. a heart issue. Yeah, it is, and I like that passage, First Timothy six seventeen to nineteen. Um, because what it doesn't say is that you're in sin if you're rich, right? Um, God right. gives uh, to each person differently. And I often say, you know what? It's not God's will for us to be uh, you know, rich and, and wealthy, though he may do that. Um, and, and he may do that. And, and for the glory of God, uh, if you are thinking of God's kingdom first, um, th- this may be a case of God really blessing you with riches um, because you are a good steward of what he provides to you. Um, and, and so th- there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with having a nice car, having a nice house and all that kinds of stuff, but don't make an idol out of those things. You know, the, the question that um, I, I heard one time was if you lose your house, you know, if your house gets gets destroyed, are you destroyed, right? Um, are you putting all your hope in there? And, you know, I, I've you watch news clips when, for instance, a major, a massive tornado blows through and the house is destroyed. How does the family respond a lot of times? You know, it's obvious it's a huge loss when you, you lose your house. And so obviously there's going to be, you know, you're not going to be happy in in that moment, but um, you you can tell the difference between someone whose hope is in the Lord versus someone who, who sees their life is completely shattered because they have lost their home. Um, There was a family that I knew of that uh, their house burned down in these major wildfires here in California. And this was probably about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, in response to their house being burned down, the father told uh, the pastor and and part of our church, told one of the pastors at our church, said, well, the good news is that our permanent residence is still intact. And he was pointing up to the sky, you know, in reference to to heaven and what is to come. So so that's an example of someone who is not making an idol of what they have. And the book of Ecclesiastes says, look, Enjoy what you've got, right? Uh, you, you you're receiving some of that should be enjoyed. You you should, you know, take some good trips yeah. with your family and all that. You know, just not making an idol out of that. So for those who are wealthy, I mean, just think in terms of is here's the question that I would start with is is the is your spiritual walk just part of your life, or is your life really centered around your desire to follow Christ? Right, uh, Jesus Christ is not someone that we just kind of add to to the outskirts of our life. He's not a component of our life. He is really the center of our life. He, we've given our lives to him. We are, we are his slaves, literally, and he he is our master. And so we follow after him and seek to glorify him. And so when you start with that concept, then you then work outwards towards the okay. How how are we being stewards of the money that we've got? So what I don't want to do is I don't want to encourage anyone to start being judgmental of those who are wealthy, one, just because they're wealthy, or two, just because yeah. they have nice things. Because in some cases, I know some wealthy folks that are very generous with what they've got. You know, And I know for Alice and I, when we bought a new house here in Brawley, we bought one with a, a nice open layout with the idea that we want people to be able to come into our home. We want to be able to have fellowship here. We want this to be a place where people can yeah. enjoy time with each other. But you know there there's another there's another question in all of this because a lot of times when people think oh you pastors you guys are just about 
giving, 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 give to the church, give to the church, give to the church. And then you guys just want to hoard that up within the church. You know, let's let's stop and think for a moment what it is that you're supporting when you give to the church. I mean, first of all, it's going to be the leaders at the church who should have met the qualifications of Titus uh, tit Titus 1 or 1 Timothy 3, right? The qualifications for an elder. Mm -hmm. And these are yeah. people who have shown themselves to be trustworthy in terms of not only walking uh, with God, but also in their lives, that they have shown themselves to be responsible with their time and their money, how they raise their family. Those are the kinds of individuals that you want to be able to oversee those kinds of payments. Um, but when we think about the church at large, you know, for us, we've got a We've got a blessed facility. It's it's been all paid off, which I'm thankful for. But utility costs are going up, right? Utility, water, especially in the summer, air conditioning. Um, we got air conditioning units that uh, that that go out and, and need to be replaced. We've got maintenance for the buildings and all that. Well, you know, people might say, "Well, is all of that necessary?" Well, think about you know, in the early church, you had house churches, and obviously, some people like to go back to those house church. Uh, models for that reason, because it's less less upkeep and, and less overhead cost and all that. But when you start to get more and more believers coming together, it makes sense to have a facility where people can come together and, yeah. and be able to not only worship, but have uh, ministries uh, for their children, to, to be able to do a number and a variety of different things on that church campus. That's what it's for. It's It's a spiritual, it's a physical community center for the church to be able to come together and not only that, you're also paying for whoever needs to, to to be paid to help upkeep, maintain. We've got an office manager. We've got a facilities manager. And then that, in addition to us as pastors who have devoted our life to um, preaching, teaching, counseling, and, and trying to do everything we can to provide spiritual guidance and, and stewardship over the church. So for this reason, for those who are a part of a church, I would encourage you to attend a budget meeting. Um, for the church. It sounds like uh, th this is more corporate. Well, th this is the reality. Um, th your leaders um, take a responsibility before God for the money that they receive to make sure it's spent on the right things. And not only that, but guess what? Missionaries, guess where missionaries get their money? Missionaries get their money from faithful churches who support them, right? And when you start to buy materials, we we have evangelism materials, we've got um, devotional packets, yeah. we've got classes, um, you know, we, we've got adventure clubs, so we've got a number of different things that we're doing. We're, we're serving food fellowship for fellowship purposes and all that, you know, there's a lot that can really happen through the church and it's a tremendous, tremendous influence upon the community around that church when it's done well. Um, so when you're giving to the church, it's not just, don't think of it as just a pastor says, I want more money. I want more money. I want more money. Yeah. Think in terms of what that church is doing. And if that church is faithful, think about the glory that is being given to God through each of the ministries, community events, evangelism, whatever it may be. Think about the, the glory that's being given to God and think about your part in it, whether it's going to be your time devoted to it or the money that you give to it. So it, so for the rich person, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, Think in terms of how can I glorify God with what God has given me? It doesn't mean that you rob yourself of every enjoyable pleasure, that you yeah. can't go on nice trips and all that kinds of stuff. God has blessed you with that. But see to it that the riches that have been given to you, when you stand before God, you, you can stand before God with a clean conscience knowing that I have used what you have given me to help further your kingdom. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. I think the temptation that Satan would bring is actually the same for both groups of people. Um, yeah. and, and it concerns uh, whether or not they're giving enough. Um, and, and again, that's not to say to put a number on that, but um, but because the giving is primarily an act of worship, and we talked about the very practical things to which the giving goes towards funding. Uh, but in reality, even if you were in a church that you know, had very little of those things. Um, it it shouldn't cause you not to give because you're 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 acknowledging right. your giving is meant to be a form of worship by which you yeah. acknowledge that all you have is God's, and you're just giving some back a, as a form of saying, "Lord, I trust you for my needs. Thank yeah. you for what you've blessed me with. Um, I, I want to give to uh, the 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 work doing in, in this local place." And so um, 
it, yeah. And so for those who are struggling, oftentimes, um, the, again, the question is, are we being good stewards? Maybe we're spending uh, money going to the movies every month, but we're not giving anything to the church. For the wealthy, it may be that their capacity to give is so far greater than what they're doing, and they're just not doing it um, b- because they're not thinking, how can I best honor the Lord with what I have. And again, um, this isn't to put any, well, it is to put pressure on people to understand that the expectation is that you honor God in your giving, uh, whatever that might be. And so, and we take into account again, which, you know, we'll say a few times, um, God's expectation is that you, you meet the needs of your family, um, of your obligations, uh, you know, things like that. Um, those things come come first and are primary, obviously, um, and and then whatever you can do beyond that. And I like that you talked about time as well, um, but also just practical things. Um, it, you know, maybe maybe you can't give a lot, but you have a connection and you can provide all the toilet paper for the church. I mean, yeah. that's pretty yeah. necessity. It's a pretty big necessity. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I just use a very practical example. Um, you know, you, you know that uh, the church provides coffee at, you know, the fellowship meals or whatever. Um, maybe you can't get a lot, of, a lot of money, but you have access to the coffee. Uh, just throwing out a few random things to kind of help folks think, how can I give to the house of the Lord, the work of the Lord in, in meaningful ways? Um, and so all those things are helpful. But I think I would I would press upon people. Um, whether poor or rich, not to trust even in just that kind of giving. Um, it 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 needs to be an act of worship. It doesn't earn yes. you grace yeah. with God. Right. It doesn't keep um grace with God. And um it, it's it's an act of worship and it needs to be done in the right heart. And I think Ananias and Sapphira is the perfect example right. of giving money in in and how God views giving in a wrong way. I mean, they sold their property. They didn't have to. They um, conspired together to not give the whole amount, but make it seem as though they were. And so they came, they gave the money to the apostle, and God killed them because they lied, making it seem as though they were these uh, great givers when they hadn't given what they, they were portraying themselves as giving. Um, and, and so your your heart in this is really what matters. And I think for for us as pastors, we want to see people give to the Lord because they love the Lord. Yeah. And when there's no giving, it's usually an indication of some misunderstanding or even some heart issue, or maybe it's just more love for the things of the world and the things of the church. Yeah, and and that's why I said it's got to start with um, your walk with the Lord and your desire to to glorify Him, um, and, and use what you've been given to to do that. If you start from that standpoint, then I think you're fulfilling what Romans twelve says to offer up your your bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Um, every aspect of, of your life is an act of of worship, and at at the point where it becomes meritorious. And what do I mean by that? At the point where you think giving is something that you do in order to earn credit with, with God, um, or at the point where you give and you're giving grudgingly, you're you're giving, you know, with this sense of dread that you wish you can keep that money. Well, guess what? That's actually not glorifying God and, and you're better off just, just keeping it. You know, the Ananias and Sapphira story, um, verse three when Peter confronts Ananias, said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, keep in mind, Ananias and Sapphira, they sold land, and they give gave the proceeds of the, the land uh, to the church, but they didn't give it all. The, the lie was that they pretended like they gave it all, right? Yeah. And and so the, the sin wasn't that they didn't give it all. The, the sin was that they lied about giving it all. So Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? and to keep back some of the price of the land. Now, if you stop right there, some people say, see, he kept back some of it. He should have given it all. Well, verse 4 says, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In other words, while the land was unsold, that, that belonged to you. And even after you sold it, the proceeds, that was under your control. You didn't have to give it all, you, you know, but you you 
you end up giving some and then you lied and pretended like you gave it all in order to receive uh, adulation from men and look look at these look at these uh, completely selfish unselfish givers Ananias and Sapphira and, and so God uh, in this case the the honesty and integrity um, is actually more important than the amount that was given yeah. and and so a great point uh, you, you know for those that don't have a lot even if you can give a little bit as long as you're being responsible and and not uh, and and not shortchanging the um, the support that you need to provide for family members and, and for your own needs, um, that's going to give more glory to God than someone who is wealthy and might give more, but it really is not nearly the same kind of sacrifice, right? Um, so yeah, it, 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 it does come down to the heart. And, and, and let me add this as well. You know, I, I spoke about, you know, kind of the needs of the church and the things that churches does. And you're right, depending upon the church size there, um, some of those costs that I mentioned may or may not be a big deal. Um, but in, in the end, this this is this is the reality. God actually doesn't need our money. Yep. He he doesn't. So he he can accomplish whatever he wants without that money. That that money is really an outward display of an inward gratitude and desire to please the Lord. And, and it's the same thing in the Old Testament. When the Israelites gave, uh, and, and there were free will offerings in the Old Testament. I mean, when Moses was um, collecting funds for the uh, tabernacle, at some point he had to he had to tell them, stop, stop, this is actually more than, than what we need. Um, but the, the free will offerings are meant to be an expression of, this is, this is how much God means to me, and also how much I, I trust in Him, right? Um, so th this is the heart attitude of one who gives, and this is why I've been at my current church now for almost five years, and I remember someone told me halfway through, you know, you're the first Baptist pastor I've ever listened to that never gave a message on giving. Um, well, because my desire is to feed you the Word of God, and in feeding you the Word of God, that should help guide you in terms of what you should do financially. So it, it all comes down to the heart and uh, and what you're living for and and the the your finances they're just an outward flow of what's going on in your heart yeah yeah and i think you know a lot of us you know i i would i can't imagine doing a standalone sermon on on giving necessarily um we preach what's in the text so if i came right. across it in the text i'd preach it but you know on the podcast like this it's a good opportunity just in a general way yeah um, absolutely to, to to help people consider um, stewarding what they have well, and we could do this on various topics. Are you, mm -hmm. you, you know, are you stewarding your time well? Are you stewarding your talents well? Yeah. You know, I I would make the uh, same the argument that the for Holy those Spirit things. has given you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if you have particular talents and you're only using them to obtain wealth for yourself or favors in the world, and you're not offering them to the the church or to believers in, in when you're able to do that yeah. um th then i would say that's an issue of poor stewardship too and i think all these things they they affect you know the more faithful we are in every area of life affects our overall spiritual health not only that but it affects how we view uh, scriptures it affects how we pray it affects how we interact with other believers i mean all of these areas of our life are are truly interconnected um, in our spiritual walk. And when our hearts are so molded in 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 a way that we start viewing everything we have as a gift from God, yeah. belonging to God. Um, and though Paul here in in this chapter in Timothy with the rich people is talking about money, that, I mean, that's really our heart attitude should be for everything is that we are generous looking for opportunities to give. Um, give our time, um, give our prayers, give comfort, give, you know, our talents, wh whatever it is. Um, it, this just happens to be a particular area that, you know, like what I was talking about before we started, uh, guys in our circles, we don't often like to talk about this, but it's meaningful. Um, and it's meaningful for those who are give. I mean, every church does, you know, giving different in the service. And I think largely those fall in the reference category, uh, whether you, there's nothing wrong with passing a plate. There's nothing wrong, uh, with the way our church does it. We just have offering baskets in the back. Yeah. Um, I think there are things you need to say to help shepherd people understand no matter how you format that. 
Um, you know, what I want people to understand is when you write that check, when you uh, hit that button on the website, um, I would, I love, I encourage people to just even say a short prayer, thanking God that they're, they're able to give. Um, and that kind of keeps our heart yeah. in, in the right posture. And it, and it reminds us that we're giving not just to keep, you know, um, hand soap in the bathrooms for the church. <laughs> right. We're we're giving because we love God and we're thankful and it's an act of worship. And so um, I would just encourage people even, you know, here on the podcast, before you give, just say a short prayer thanking God for what he's provided for yeah. you. Um, and no matter how little you have um, or, or how much you have, what you have, God's provided. And I'm sure if you think about it, God's provided everything that you need ultimately. Right. Um, and so it just keeps our hearts in 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 the right posture. Any any other thoughts on that? No, I I I do like the example that you gave in terms of you know sometimes people are not giving money but they're giving for instance food. And I live in an agriculture area, and we do have you know we have one lady that often shares um, fresh eggs. Uh, she's got her own hens that she raises, so she'll share eggs with us. We've got people that will share lettuce or you know, romaine lettuce in one case, um, onions, oranges, fruit. Uh, we got people that uh, drop off meat uh, with us at various times of the year. And what a blessing that is. Um, so th there's a lot of different ways that that you can be giving it. It doesn't always have to be a uh, green paper, right? Uh, it can be uh, anything that, that you can give that would bless the church. We've had some people that have been through some very difficult procedures recently, and we've got a, a ministry of of ladies who who will cook meals and bring them to that person, so that person doesn't have to worry about meals. And uh, she, she was extremely thankful for that. Um, so there's so many ways that that you can be giving, but I, I would say that in thinking through how you can give to God's purposes, um, do think about the needs of the local church first. Sometimes people will jump towards giving lots of money to parachurch ministries. Yeah. And parachurch ministries, and when I say parachurch ministries, parachurch, it's um, it's not something that's under the authority uh, of a church itself, but it operates as an independent kind of ministry. And, and there are parachurch ministries that um, do good things and, and are worthy of your support. Um, but first and foremost, make sure that you're giving to the needs of your local church, and then whatever you have uh, above and beyond that, then I would go ahead and encourage, uh, encourage uh, blessing that uh, parachurch uh, ministry. But um, don't forsake uh, the, the needs of the local church. And as always, and as we've been stressing all along, make sure you do it with a heart attitude of worship and thankfulness to God, because really this should be a thanks offering. Yeah. And I think, let me give an illustration concerning the parachurch thing, because, uh, you, you know, this is a thing in our day. Occasionally, um, I've come across, uh, in, in fact, just a year or two ago, um, someone contacted me and basically told me they stopped giving to their church and they were giving everything to uh, a parachurch. I don't remember all the details, but you know, my, my advice to them was stop that, <laughs> you yeah. know, what, what you're saying is you have no love for your local church. So why, what, you know, why are you there? You need to sort some priorities out. Um, but it, yeah, I think, you know, the parachurch thing to give to a parachurch when your church has needs is the equivalent of starving your own children to feed your neighbor's children. No. Um, it's it it's not it's not something that I believe God honors, um, and so I think it can be done um, not intentionally. Uh, but those are things that we should think about. No. Um, and it, you know, when you were talking about guys who uh, share, you know, in in the form of items, right, goods. Um, who bring, um, I especially like the ones who bring you meat. Um, <laughs> but, but, Always a um, special place in my heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, it, so those are great ways uh, to, to give. And I think I instantly thought about like churches. I've had a lot of this in Africa. Um, so I, I, I love Africa, the African continent. My, my heart is definitely there. Um, and you, what you have there is you often have uh, uh, churches, you have some faithful men preaching. There's just not a lot of money at all, right? The, there's everyone struggling. And so one of the ways that um, Christians in places like that will provide for their pastors or even go above and beyond providing for their pastors just to bless 
their pastors, just to acknowledge that they're they're doing the work of the Lord. Their life is surround is revolves around the church. They'll do just those similar kind of things. They'll they'll bring an extra chicken. They'll yeah. they'll they'll oh. give a goat. Um, they'll they'll fix something in their house, yeah. right? Um, and so I know you have guys who do that in your church and we're new in our church. And I mean, we've been just overwhelmed at how gracious people have been, um, helping us with little things and just gifting things. It's meaningful and, and they do it to one another too. And so, um, look for ways to, you know, to do that for your elders, for your pastors, look for ways to do that with other congregation members, um, you know, you see someone's having a hard time down and out and you, you can just bless them with, you know, whatever, um, and, and do all of that, I think as, as an act of worship before God, um, and love for one another, you know, it's mm-hmm. interesting that passage that gets ripped out of context, kicking and screaming all the time, they'll know you for your love. Um, yeah. well, that has a context. You know, and the context yeah. is, are, is the brother, the the brethren, Fellow right? Disciples, yep, that's right. They'll they'll love you. They'll they'll know that you're my disciples for your love for one another. And the idea is that the world, though they won't come necessarily to the the knowledge of the gospel by seeing us, they will know that we are somehow very different because of the 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 intentional care we give to one another. Yeah, um, they'll know that we're we're unique. The and it, and it, it, just think about it. The world has um, plenty of, you know, food banks and plenty of well digging ministries. I mean, there's a lot of those things the world does. The church should do those things even better, right? I mean, we should look after e- each other even more than the world does those humanitarian type aids. And it should always start in your local church, right? Consider your local church like a family. It's your family. Yeah. You know, are, are the needs in your local family taken care of? Are, you know, are your children being fed? Make sure that happens before you feed your neighbor's children. Um, and then if there's abundance, then by all means, right? Um, seek the Lord. Consider, you know, maybe you need to set some aside for retirement. Maybe you need to set some aside for your co- kids' college funds. And then maybe you uh, have extra that you can give away, um, but be good stewards. And that's kind of the, the point of all this. And good stewards so that um, not just your, your, your church attendance or your outward appearance um, looks to be right, but even down to you know, the, the, the innermost parts of your heart as doing those things as an act of worship is right. Because ultimately, that's what God's going to look at. Um, God doesn't care if you give a million dollars to the church, um, if you have no love for the church and if you aren't doing it out of love for him, um, you know, that million dollars might as well be a sewage dump in the nostrils of God, if that's the case. And that was the case with Ananias and Sapphira. Um, just do a study on, um, fault on, on, on wrong worship in scripture. Um, Aaron's sons, right? Again, Committing acts of worship wrongly. Um, Nadab, yeah, and Nadab and Abihu. The they offered fire, strange yep. fire mm-hmm. and God killed them. They were going through the motions of worship wrongly, right? Um, w- with the wrong heart and, and God didn't receive it. And so. Amen to that. Yeah. And I, what came to mind was the book of Malachi final book of the old Testament. And you see priests that are offering up lame sacrifices, um, same kind of thing. Um, so we want to make sure that our worship that we offer up is done with a right heart and that we are giving sacrificially, but, uh, as a cheerful giver. Yeah. You mentioned Malachi. Let's just kind of end on, on this note because Malachi is one of those passages that man, the prosperity gospel, like, butchers yeah. you know give it'll be shaken down pressed overflowing yeah. you know that's not saying um that god is like some divine lottery ticket that you're guaranteed to win if you give yeah. it, you know um god wants your 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 heart he wants your mind your soul yeah. your strength he wants you to worship him with all that you have 
Um, and so we want to be faithful, but we want to be good stewards and don't buy into the temptation and the lies of the prosperity gospel, which basically says you can buy your best life now yeah. through your offerings to the church. Um, I, I think you said it earlier. If your temptation was ever to give money to God so that you can get something out of him, better you just keep your money. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly don't bring it to my church, <laughs> you know, and I know you wouldn't want it either. Yeah. Um, you know, we want, you know, we, we want true worshipers in, in our churches. And I know the guys uh, that we know are very faithful, um, but we can all reconsider, you know, our stewardship um, in, in Western society. Time is probably an e just as big of one um, mm -hmm. where, where we steward our, our time. Well, well, you know, there are many professing believers who are happy to sit in front of the TV for 40 hours a week, but they won't come, you know, to functions at the church or whatever. Yeah. And so that that's a stewardship issue too. So, right. um, yeah. Any last thoughts? And then I think we're done on this episode. No, I, I think this, uh, th this covered it well, maybe, maybe in another episode, we can talk about, uh, how do we think about giving to people outside the church, uh, mercy ministries and things like that. That could be a future topic. Yeah, we'll we'll shoot for that on the next one. So, guys, I hope that this has been helpful to you. I know for some it's a little bit of an uncomfortable topic, but it's a biblical topic. God wants all of you, just some of you, and he, and he wants all of you with the right heart, and that's really the point. So hope that this was helpful to you, and until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.